to the January 10th, 2024 meeting of the Wichita Land Bank Board of Trustees. I'm Sarah Gooding. I'm the Real Property Section Manager and would like to turn it over to our chair to call us to order. Why don't we, uh, we do not have a uh, quorum right now, so let's just go ahead and start item two under staff administrative activity report. Sarah, can you start on that? Sure. Um, yeah, we have the November 8th, 2023 meeting minutes and then the administrative activity reports. And actually, Lance, would you be willing to share some highlights on that? You're still on mute, Lance. Okay, with Lance's audio issues, I can jump in on that. And, okay. Um, so Lance has been working on a community outreach and engagement strategy for the land bank. Um, the strategy really focuses on two districts at a time, starting with districts where we anticipate heavy land bank based activity. Um, I believe it's districts one and four that we would be looking at really trying to attend DABs, neighborhood associations and others here in this first third of the year, um, rolling to, I believe it was districts three and six in the second third of the year some follow up activities in districts one and four and then rolling on to districts um, two and five, I believe, toward the end of the year. So we have a rolling strategy where we're always active in various districts in terms of just keeping that communication line open, being faces at different meetings, district board meetings, et cetera. Um, he has also been working on updating some materials and resources that we've seen with other land banks. Uh, very um, technical information, but um, trying to just make sure that we have the resources in place to facilitate ease um, with more activity. Um, I will say I've also received information. We do have one guest who will be joining us here in just a bit. So um, let's see, Lance um, has been attending some training on behalf of the Land Bank. He attended a Build America, Buy America Act. Um, and this is because our funding source is community development block grant funds. And so any sort of federal regulations and priorities that come down, we are required to be in compliance. Um, Build America, Buy America is very specifically focused on the importance of using American made materials in federally funded projects. And so this could impact larger scale projects that we have where we need to make sure that steel, construction materials and others are all made in America. Um, we do expect this to be a burdensome and cumbersome process. It will probably drive up costs. It is also federal policy and we have to abide by it. And so staff are working to become educated on it. We do have a fourth board member joining us. Welcome, Kay. Go ahead, Sarah. Sure. Okay, we are working through the admin report and then we can come back and officially uh, start business parts of the meeting. Um, Lance and I both have been involved in the city's website transition. Uh, we are working to make sure that we are leveraging the new website platform in ways that make this as accessible as possible. If you look at the project page on the city's website right now, um, you'll see where a lot of the content has been just kind of lumped into the new platform. And over the next couple months, we will be working to really streamline that, make it as user friendly as possible. Um, we also, Lance, um, Roger and myself also attended a meeting with Zoom Grants, which is a platform we've used for a couple of our other projects here. Um, this is not necessarily a platform we're looking at using with Land Bank yet but we will be using it with the Affordable Housing Fund program. We will be using it with some other programs and it could in the future be a management tool um, for the land bank. Um, see, we've been looking at the Ninth and Ash properties and I'll share a little bit more later, but we have had quite a bit of interest in those properties. We've been in communication with developers about what sorts of opportunities and how those opportunities could pair with various programs and incentives that we offer within housing. We don't have an application yet, but I've been told that we should expect one just about any day. And so we are looking forward to piloting through the disposition part of the process with those properties, hopefully in the very near future. And then Lance is also still working through um, developing print collateral, collateral for the land bank. 
So that concludes our administrative activity report, and we would be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for anybody? Uh, Sarah, when <clears throat> when will the uh, forms, the property inquiry response letter, the donation forms, when are those expected to be on the website? I'm on the website now, mm -hmm. and it just shows that if you're wanting to donate, just call this number or email. Yes. Is there a time frame when those forms would be done? I know Lance was having some audio issues. Um, Lance has been working on those. Would you be able to type a response? Billy, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, okay good. Um, those will be done this month. Um, and Sarah and I went to some web based training, so we should be able to get those on the uh, on the website you know, before the end of the month, I'm hopeful, if not the very beginning of next. And and I, I haven't looked at the I haven't looked at the website, but does the development application that we've talked about, is that on the website also, or is it going to be? I think it was not yet. Um, it was emailed out to our list of identified developers that came through um, our people who were interested in public housing properties. Okay. Um, it is now with the new website. Yes, we do have a place for those and we have a landing platform. And so okay. we can make sure that that is up within the next couple of days. Sounds good. Any other questions on the uh, administrative activity report? If not, let's go back to the minutes of November 8th, 2023. I think you've all had a chance to read and review the minutes. Is there any question on the minutes? If not, I uh, look for a motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a motion? Hello, this is okay, yes. I got a motion from Kay. Uh, Alex, you want a second? Okay, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Oppose the same sign. OK, those pass. I believe uh, we've got 5-0 on the call currently, right? Uh, I think we have four, don't we? OK, yes, yes, that is correct. Yep. Want to make sure I'm tracking that correctly. Thank you. Yep. OK, um, I think we're ready to go to item number three, acquisition and disposition uh, updates. So let's talk about Ninth and Ash. Yes, so we have had interest from multiple developers when we had first opted to acquire those properties we had vetted it with two potential developers um, we have heard from more than what we originally anticipated um, again we've tried to assist developers talking through potential pairings with other programs such as home um, housing development loan program which allows us to assist um, with gap infill development so really those two programs um, pair together well. So um, as we've provided that advice, developers are very interested. Um, we do expect to receive an application from one developer just about any day. Um, as we built out the next phases of that process, what our plan is, is that once we receive that application or any application from any developer, we will probably try to vet that within 48 hours to determine if we have a valid application um, that has enough information to consider complete and begin working. At that point in time, we will notify our whole developer list, and especially making sure that we notify those who have been in communication with us, that we will be closing that opening in 30 days. And that way, if anyone is working on an application, they have adequate time to finish up other applications. Um, that 30 days, I think, for staff preparedness needs to end at least two weeks before a board meeting so that we can vet those applications, um, bring agenda packets and a fully vetted application to the board, and then allow the board to consider the applications and opportunities that are available. We don't want to release in any information from any of the applications until we released all to the board. Um, and at that point, the hope would be that the board could review um, one, two, three, four, ten applications for those parcels altogether. Now, the board could choose to recommend one of those applications, 
the board could choose to reject all the applications. Um, but that's the process that we're planning to outline. And then um, with the Affordable Housing Review Board, we've had those who make proposals for those funds come to the board meeting. Um, and that way they're there to answer questions about their applications. And we would recommend the same with the Land Bank Board of Trustees. So anticipate a proposal in the next, hopefully, 30 days on 9th and Ash then. Okay. Yes. And I've been in uh, close communication with that developer. Okay. Any other item B, potential acquisitions? So we are still working through the, I think we've been talking about this since July, but there is a multifamily apartment complex um, that the more we dig into it, the more complex things get. Um, we still see it as a very interesting opportunity, one that would be a really incredible use of the land bank if we can make it work. Um, our legal staff has actually been working through next steps um, with it. And as they've done additional review into the history of this particular parcel, um, they have found that there are some additional mortgages on the property that we were not aware of previously. Um, our understanding is that some of this funding is actually home funding, which is another funding source managed through housing and community services. Um, and so it would be due and payable upon sale or transfer of the property. It's basically in the form of a deferred loan. Um, the challenge is that currently there is no entity that holds that debt. Um, that entity has been dissolved for quite some time. And so at this point, law is recommending basically to try to navigate through the legal considerations to see if we have a viable project before we bring it to the board for formal consideration. Um, I will say that this is kind of an example of with community development block grant funds, we have opportunities to take on some very interesting, very challenging and very meaningful projects, but they tend not to be easy projects. Um, they don't move quickly, and there often is a lot of in-depth review to try to figure out. And so I wanted to bring back to the board at our previous meeting, we thought we'd have it ready. And then we did another layer of digging and found another layer of challenge. And so the, the possibility remains alive, but it's not ready to bring to the board yet. So is that a 60, 90 day period, or do we have any idea, Sarah? I'm going to look into Sally and Jeff to see if they have any sense. I know Jeff has been involved in those conversations from the law perspective. Yeah, once we get the uh, administrative order to go forward, we'll file a lawsuit to request a judicial assignment of these mortgages to the city. Then if we can obtain that, then in essence, we just pay ourselves and we'll be OK. We're, they're out there with a the former nonprofit entity that's been defunct for 21 years, and there's just no entity there that to uh, get an assignment from. So we're seeking the judicial course uh, that would allow a judge to assign it to us in this scenario. So again, Jeff, you're thinking 60, 90 days? Is About that... 90 probably because we get that 90, okay. and then file it and, you know, just the court process at that time. We'll, there's no witnesses, so to speak. Yeah. So we're just going to have a hearing. So it'd be the question of how quickly we could get a hearing in front of a judge. And it could be Thank sooner you, than 90, but I want to try to make sure. I'm... Thank you again. Any other potential acquisitions, Sarah? Not at this time. Okay, let's move on to the ongoing item updates, joint board workshop. You want to give us just a little scenario on that? Yes, we'll do a little teaser for tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is our joint board workshop. I think this began as a dream within this board um, and was also carried over to the Affordable Housing Review Board. Um, each of the boards has a slice of work um, that connects in, as we just shared, in some interesting ways with some of the work of other boards and the greater work for affordable housing in the community. And so as conversation around this event matured, um, it went from being talking about well, what does the other board do and bringing the boards together to really a holistic opportunity to talk about housing in Wichita? And so tomorrow we will meet from 1 to 3.30 in the council chambers at City Hall. 
um, we will talk about really kind of how did we get here? How did each of these boards form and what were the pressures and needs and opportunities that led to the forming of each board? We'll talk about where we are now and we'll have presentations from representatives of the Metropolitan Area Planning Department, Metropolitan Area Building and Codes Department, um, Economic Development and Housing and Community Services, talking about the big picture that we're operating within and the many ways the city interfaces with housing and especially with housing affordability and affordable housing. Um, we'll take a little break and then come back and share a little bit more about the specific work that's being done in the newly created real property section. That's the section that I manage. It includes the Wichita Land Bank. It includes HOME, which is a funding source that really can assist with housing development at affordable levels. It includes um, home repair, which um, homeowner occupied assistance for critical repairs. Um, I will say that we have some news releases going out tomorrow related to our home repair program and um, some new opportunities through that program. So that's exciting. Um, it also includes our affordable housing fund which was created really out of the COVID pandemic to target resources to sustain housing affordability in particular units for the next 10 to 15 years. And then finally, it includes our public housing program, um, which has quite a bit of activity between um, working through a rental assistance demonstration program to convert our multifamily housing units, get them really refurbished for the next generation and also led to the sale of 352 single family homes, um, which our staff is currently in the process of doing. Now, each of these as a one off is interesting. There's a lot of opportunity, but together it becomes a really powerful toolbox um, to create, develop, maintain and sustain affordable housing units in Wichita. And so um, and then I think Logan will cap us off with really looking at housing strategies going forward. And so we do, we do invite all board members from both this board and the Affordable Housing Review Board to attend. Um, this is also a really great opportunity for anybody who would consider themselves interested in housing or a stakeholder. And the meeting will be recorded and available later for public viewing as well. Okay, any questions on that? Let's go ahead and move to the uh, 2023 State of Land Banking Survey. And I'm going to share my screen while Lance presents. Sorry, back a couple slides. There we go. Okay. 2023. Uh banking survey conducted by the Center of Community Progress. We included this in your uh, attachments. If you haven't reviewed it, I'd recommend you doing so. There's a lot of uh, a lot of really informative information in here about land banks and and some of their challenges and what they're doing and some of their goals. And I just wanted to I wanted to uh, present on a few key points that came out of the survey as it relates to us as a land bank here in Wichita. Um, the first is the survey respondents included uh, 92 different land banks, um, which I think is that's a phenomenal um, survey return if if you ask me, but um, it's uh, 92 land banks. As you can see from the map, the highest concentration seems to be northeast and uh, actually Kansas, Texas and Nebraska are on the west end of that looking in. So I don't know if that means that it started east and it's working its way west, but uh, Sarah and I were discussing that it does work its way west. We may see it on the, the west coast before any of the uh, next quarter of the country as, as things progress. But um, in order for your responses to be counted in this survey, you have to be uh, an entity of two or more years. So um, any new land banks aren't reflected in here. Um, most of the countywide, most of the footprint of these land banks are countywide with uh, the next highest representation being municipal. Uh, I found that pretty interesting uh, in just some 
incidental web research that I've done, there, there's a lot of them that are hosted out of economic development or even the appraiser's office of a lot of counties. So I think that's what represents that large percentage of county governments. Next slide, please. Uh, of the priorities of land banks, uh, the collective number one priority is to support the creation of affordable housing, with the number two priority being addressing vacant lots, uh, followed by conducting renovations, increasing property inventory, and other, which includes demolition, brownfield rehabs, and others. But based on these responses, I'd say our priorities as a land bank align with most land banks in the country, uh, particularly in the areas of affordable housing and addressing vacant lots. Next slide. For uh, priorities for the land, oops, sorry. Uh, for top challenges of the land bank, um, funding was the number one common thread uh, threat to various land banks with a total response of 65%. Uh, that wasn't surprising in that uh, for most public programs, funding is the number one obstacle. Uh, we weren't surprised by that. Furthermore, we weren't surprised that the that inventory and political issues ranked as second and third. Uh, however, we were intrigued by the fact that they were only identified as challenges by a fairly low percentage of respondents. Uh, only 24% said that uh, lack of inventory was an issue, and only 16% said that uh, political leadership um, and associated issues were, were part of that issue. So next slide, please. This next slide, I think, might kind of answer that question for us. Um, where land bank inventory comes from? Uh, land banks report that two thirds of their inventory comes from tax liens and foreclosures, while the remaining one third comes from transfers from public entities, private market purchases, donations, and other means. I think this illustrates the nationwide reliance on tax lien and foreclosure properties for inventory. And I think it affirms what we saw on the previous slide that uh, inventory was represented in such a low percentage of concerns for land banks. Uh, it's an interesting discussion. And um, of that one third remaining, we have the additional um, challenge of, of our funding, which kind of forbids us from going into some of these other other acquisitions uh, such as donations and transfers from public entities. So I found these numbers uh, pretty illuminating. Uh, with that, I'll just break for any questions or comments and move on to or move on to the next agenda item. I have a quick question. This is Kay. Lynn, given that the data and you may have answered this, but I want to make sure how what interpretations about our work, how will this inform our, our next steps? Is there anything that you feel like we need to do differently as a result of this data? Um, yes, I think and I think we're going to cover this in more depth in in uh, upcoming items today, but uh, basically our ability to um, have access to properties in the tax sale or foreclosure sales would be a, a big thing. And then funding, if we had a funding source that allowed us to either purchase from the private market or from tax uh, or from the tax sale or would even allow us to take transfers and donations that didn't require the CDBG um, requirements such as environmental and noise and things like that, then we could possibly gain more traction in our market. That's I think, helpful. thank you. I think it's interesting to note that the many of the properties we've considered, we've considered a couple of donation options, but most have actually been transfers from public entities looking to properties currently available through the city of Wichita. 
And as we were reviewing what we've attempted so far, we realized we've had at least seven projects that we've looked at um, between a property at 235 and, and kind of along Interstate 235. And then I think we identified six properties along Central that we had interest in potentially acquiring. But as we ran the noise analysis, none of those would have produced CDBG eligible outcomes within what the developers could do while maintaining affordability. They would have required soundproofing and insulation and other things that would have driven up that really narrow cost margin. Um, and really that's the arena we've been operating in so far. Um, we've had a couple of donations we've considered and again found that they don't really meet our funding opportunities. We haven't really delved into the private market purchases yet. Um, originally, there's really been kind of a strong sense that we don't want to get into trying to spend a lot of money to acquire properties. And some of the areas we're interested in, um, people recognize there is interest in redevelopment and some of them are going to hold on to the properties. Um, they're not necessarily interested in donating. And so I think especially this particular slide shows what sort of opportunity we're missing through not being able to participate in tax sale. Um, and I think the prior slide really illustrates that funding, it's not just us. Um, and we actually do have a large pot of funds. We have more than 377,000 allocated to this project, but it is federal funds with very specific guidelines. And so funding um, has emerged as a key challenge. Very helpful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I I agree. This this slide here really shows us a lot that the property tax issue and foreclosure is huge when it comes to land bank. And until we resolve that issue, we're pretty well handicapped on what we can do to to move this issue forward. So, uh, very good information. Thank you, Lance. Any other questions on this presentation? If not, Sarah, do you want to move us into the advocacy strategy? Absolutely. And I'm going to just keep the screen share pulled up and let Jeff share about part one. Okay. Thank you. Um, I talked to the city's uh, uh, staff member who's responsible for working with legislators and our um, um, and this memo that's been attached is in a format that he recommended because when it goes to the lobbyist, they really won't understand the details of a land bank. So I kind of broke it out into what it is, background, things of that nature, just to kind of, for somebody who's uneducated in this to basically get a quick understanding of what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, in Kansas, each treasurer has the ability to kind of interpret these statutes a little differently. Uh, a lot of land banks get every piece of property that doesn't sell a, at a tax foreclosure sale. And we've wanted to avoid that because of obviously the junk that comes in with that. Our problem is our treasurer says that we would have to bid, let's say there's $5,000 on a property and taxes owed. We would have to actually pay that $5,000 plus the cost of the sale. And we don't get the ability to waive that because they say we don't own it at that time. And the problem is if we go into a property at $5,000, we're upside down so bad on most of these, it's really not worth going after. And we're not going to take the entire inventory. Obviously, we're going to probably two or three properties at a, a point, so it's not that big of a deal. So what I looked at is our goal here would be to come in and do a credit bid, basically saying that $5,000, we will bid that. Plus, and then we agree to pay the county for their actual out-of-pocket cost for the sale. And then statutorily, we agree to assume if there's any infrastructure costs, which is unlikely to happen. That would be a fairly new, you know, a, a structure that's probably within 15 years old. We're really not going to run into that very often. But, uh, and then by the purchase of that, you know, we actually are not spending money. But if we're outbid, great. Everybody wins. I mean, all the, you know, the, the taxing authorities get their money, that's good. Uh, part of this would be that we're uh, granted a title that's deemed clear, so we don't have to go through the mess. And that could be a little bit of a challenge, but that's our goal, is to be able to 
come in, do a credit bid, acquire the property, and then move forward with it. There's in my memo, I talk about the, you know, the uh, um, kind of the gold standard is a super bid that Omaha or Nebraska and New York have where they can actually come in before the sale and say, I want this property and we guarantee to use it for affordable housing. And they're given that before it actually goes to the foreclosure sale. Um, I don't think we're going to get that, but that's the that has been allotted a in a couple of states at this point. And I think if we're able to do a credit bid, it opens the doors greatly because, like I said, we uh, it's so hard to you know bid, pay the money, and then, like I said, we're upside down. So this gives us a running start at it. In the memo, Sarah's provided a lot of great information to show that what benefit uh, the purchase of property by a land bank has. It you know it improves the property values, the reduces crime, things of that nature. So. You know, when I go through this, we talk about, um, you know, this is what we're wanting to do. And it's a good thing that we do this. It's not going to hurt the county. It's not going to create, you know, uh, unfair advantage on bidding or anything of that nature, I don't think. So we just have to present, you know, we get approval by the board on this policy. Uh, and if everybody, you know, whatever changes you guys want, you know, then we'll move it up the ladder with through the city to get it to our lobbyists to. Uh, present. You know, they go through the their routine. Uh, I don't have any idea, you know, if it's going to gain traction this year or not. Um, it's something to pursue and it could but pursue as a long term goal, I think. Um, and, um, you know, until then, until something like this opens the door, um, I think we'll get approval by other land banks. I think counties aren't going to throw too big of a fit about it. Um, but until we get this legislative approval, you know, we're really going to have to look at um, alternative funding to be, you know, we can't even buy a title commitment at this point without with the funding process that we have. So we're really strapped. And this is, a, I think, a great way to pursue, but nothing that's going to change things in the short term. And I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Jeff, have you had any discussion with the county? Or the treasurer's office regarding this at all? I have not. No. Is uh, that something? It's kind of weird because when you call the county, they're like, "Call my attorney," you know. And so, I, and the attorney goes, "Well, I don't know. The county's going to have to tell me." So I get a kind of a, you know, both sides of the fence in a sense. But uh, I tried to do this to where, where I put in there that you know that uh, we pay the county's cost for the sale, so that way you know they right. should not have any problems with this. And um, this eliminates this interpretation that they have that, you know, we can't waive those taxes because we don't own it at the time. And the only way we can get is to pay for them. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to propose that we uh, have another meeting with the uh, treasurer and the attorney and okay. discuss this, maybe just, you know, a small group of us to do that. So we can uh, talk about that later, Sarah. And, Jeff and mm -hmm. figure out how we want to do that because I, I think it'd be good to to make sure they're understanding what our intent is and how we move forward. Very good. And I would say that when we last had conversations, and I know Gary was in on some of those, I was in on one, I think Sally and Logan were in on several. Um, a lot of it came down to we just weren't quite able to bridge where they were standing and where we were standing. And so the hope here is to really try to build that bridge. So I think, you know, absolutely, that would be a really good next step. Um, you know, anything we can do to reconcile and find a way that we can work together is wonderful. Yep. I agree. The The only thing that I'd probably add is that it'd be nice to have some of that uh, tax sale uh, information that we've talked about putting together. I know we're still working on that, but if we had some of that to maybe give an example of what opportunities there might be in getting that those properties transferred to the land bank and some history, that also be beneficial. So uh, uh, maybe we can talk about that in the other business, see where we're at on that process. Yes. Any other questions on the advocacy strategies? 
I actually have a part two to that. Okay, go ahead, um, Sarah. Queuing up next, uh, we know the legislative session is queuing up now, um, and we are just about ready to go into city budget season. And so the second part to our advocacy strategy, and probably in some ways, the thing that um, really allows us any sort of operations is working through the city budget process to request a general fund allocation. Um, currently, the land bank is 100% funded with community development block grant funds. And so we must ensure that before we spend those funds that we have an eligible project in the pipeline. So that prevents us from doing due diligence such as title work, um, which makes it very hard to come with a fully vetted project and understand eligibility. Um, the two properties we acquired actually previously had community development block grant funds in them for a demo. And the property that we're looking at also has a history of federal funds. Um, we've done preliminary environmental analysis, but we are feeling as though without some sort of general fund to conduct title searches, which are a fairly minimal cost to help us do due diligence, we are really at a place where we can't vet projects. We can't vet um, potential acquisitions out of tax sale. We can't really vet donations. Um, and so our hope would be that um, to try to secure at least a minimal amount of funding in the current year that would allow us to conduct those basic operations, and then to really look at potentially two funding tracks in the future. Um, CDBG funding is a really valuable resource, and if we find that a project is eligible, it's a really great federal resource to leverage. But we feel like we need some general funds to operate parallel um, for projects that will not become federally eligible and or for those early expenses. And so we need to cost out what that actually looks like and kind of strategically figure out what sorts of amounts are we talking. But that is the second part of our advocacy strategy this year. Yeah, I was going to say that to me, the question is, is how many dollars you're talking about and how do we start lobbying for those funds? So, um, if I could throw out amounts, I would say 25,000 would buy us a whole lot of latitude in 2024. Um, when we looked at Wyandotte County, um, they are city county jointly funded, um, but they run at about 250,000 for a year. They also pick up every parcel that doesn't sell in tax sale and their tax sale starts bidding at the delinquent amounts owed. Um, I think, you know, we could be talking very great opportunities with 100, 150,000. But again, I, like, want to... I like that number better than I do the 25. Mm -hmm. 25 would be minimal just to function. So uh, I don't know whether is that something that as a board we need to think about, or is that something staff will determine what's the appropriate amount and, and go ahead and make that request for general budget item? I think staff can certainly put together the numbers. Um, I'm going to let Sally take over from there because she's walked through the budget process here and I haven't. Um, yeah, I mean, the staff would, you know, come together to try and, and, and figure out and put up a couple of options of what that would buy as part of the program option of the budget process. But again, but 2024 is done. I mean, the budget is done. Uh, we would, this would be working it through the process for 2025. So, you know, we, and they do we did get our first notices we have to start the budget process for 2025 just days after starting 2024 so we are in good timing right now we would need to know though that program app what they call it a program option when we are coming in and asking for money that's not in the budget now um but it would have much higher credence um with the request coming from the board well, i'd say you make up the request and we'll be more than happy to push it forward so Any other thing, anything else on the advocacy strategy? If not, let's That's move it. on. Thanks. I'm sorry. Just the thanks for working on it and getting us this far. I feel like we're making yeah. up some progress. Good, I agree. Other business. Sarah, sorry, sorry, Gary. I had a question for Sarah. Um, is the new I know the new council members just got sworn in the new mayor um, yesterday. 
but have they or are they planning to make their rounds to every department or are they visiting boards or how does that typically span out? They actually they have made their rounds and we had a really great conversation with them in December. Um, I can let Sally give some highlights, but we kind of we have a few different divisions within housing. And so we spent time talking about each division. But within this particular division, Land Bank really was that top conversation topic. I don't have much else to add. I mean, it was a very good conversation. They definitely are um, engaged and interested. A little overwhelmed because honestly, what we do is extraordinarily complicated. Um, all of the different funding sources, and you'll see a bit of that tomorrow at the at the joint workshop where we're going to kind of go over uh, some of those complications. And um, we actually did also invite the new uh, yeah. newly electeds to consider attending tomorrow. I think that's very important. That's what I was going to say. I might even make a few phone calls to invite them again because I think it'll be interesting for all of us to hear um, how it all works together or how it doesn't work together. So, yeah, I think for for the land bank part of the conversation, you know, I think there's the word about the land bank is out there, but understanding of the details and the potential impact is fairly limited. Um, I think land bank can mean a lot of different things, a lot of different places. And so we shared a little bit about, um, we've received public safety impact numbers from Habitats for Off the Block campaign. Um, I know really land bank could be key in that redevelopment. Um, talked a little bit about the safety factors of ownership of a lot and putting that unit on it versus it just becoming delinquent and ever grown. And so we felt like the response was very positive in that conversation. Yeah. I think the candidates who are now elected, a lot of the conversation I had with them before the election was about affordable housing and the land bank did come up. So I think it's going to be something they're going to continue to ask questions about and be very interested in how we move the land bank and a lot of these initiatives forward. So are we ready to move on to open discussion and other business? I believe so. Okay. Sarah had sent out a proposal to suspend regular operations of the Wichita Land Bank. Hopefully everybody's had a chance to review that. Uh, I open it up for discussion or thoughts. And I think a lot of what we've been talking about is the hindrance that we have, uh, the staffing issues because of all the properties that the city's trying to sell and working through that. Um, and until we figure out how we work with the county on these foreclosures, uh, we were sort of in a an idle position and it's been very frustrating, I think, for board members and staff members. So uh, I think what Sarah's outlined here is good. Uh, I think it's something we need to do. Uh, the timeline of 18 to 30 months, I think, I hope is a lot longer than what we really need to get our feet underneath us. But uh, I, I, I don't know how to argue that point until some of these issues resolve themselves or we work through some of the issues. Um, I think additional funding is very important, but like Sally said, that's probably a 2025 issue unless we can figure out where there's extra money and you know, maybe we do go try to get $25,000 for 2024, but I think we're going to have to have a good reason for that. But there's, you know, two or three things, the legislative amendment, the general fund allocation, the uh, working with the county. To me, those are three huge things, completing our website and getting all the information that uh, developers could utilize is also important. I think if Troy's still on the line with us, you know, some of the incentives the city has for affordable housing is another piece that I think fits in to the whole land bank issue. And my goal would be in the next six to, to nine months, maybe 12 months, that some of that gets resolved and it'd give us a little more of a foundation to start building the land bank on. So is there any other thoughts from board members, staff that, uh, regarding this 
proposal to suspend regular operations. Uh, Sarah had basically said we would skip the February board meeting and we'd meet again March with a little more substance as far as what this uh, suspension would look like uh, and maybe a few goals and objectives that we would be working on while we aren't meeting on a regular basis. So again, I apologize. I'll, I'll be quiet and ask for any input. If I could jump in for a moment, I would, this kind of came up real quick. Um, this it's conversation that has rattled around a little bit. Um, we would have had it on the agenda, but it really kind of, as we worked through the agenda development, reviewing back th things this week, conversations that happened late last week, it became apparent that you know, we've been running up against these same issues for a year now. We're also looking ahead in our staff planning efforts and the team that includes Lance Roger, and we have a vacancy currently, um, is getting ready to launch into the affordable housing fund process as well as land bank and as well as our home program operations. I'm a component of that team, but have other duties as well. And so really it spun up quickly um, with the staff capacity issues thrown on top of the advocacy challenges we continue to face. Um, and so I want to first apologize for that late notice. Um, I hope that the, basically I was asked to create a memo yesterday and get that out. And we can also share that with anybody who hasn't had a chance to review it yet. Um, but just wanted to share that it came up quickly and we really appreciate the board discussing and considering today. Um, we're really looking less at a, this is not a shutdown or anything like that, but rather it's a throttle down um, to where we're really operating in pilot mode, getting those details and things in place, um, but suspending the monthly use of board members' time and things like that while we kick this into the advocacy realms. Um, the hope would be to resolve at least the budget issue, get through some of that staff by, um, time crunch, and with those two, we can at least um, resume lower level operations. If we can reconcile the tax sale issues, it creates a whole new world of operations. Any other thoughts? It sounds like uh, the going forward is predicated on council approving budget, at least enough budget for the minor operational things. Am I to, to assume then that you all are fairly confident that council will approve those funds? At this point, that's actually still an unknown. Um, we try to listen to what the conversation is. I know that with our new mayor, that public safety has been a huge focus. And so certainly we want to share what the land bank's impact on public safety is. But the truth is that the board, the council could say, no, if we can't do it the way we've set it up, we're going to discontinue. That's that's a risk we take. Um, at the same time, we're finding that we're really struggling to operate under the way it's been set up. Is that a risk for 2024 or is that a risk for 2025? I think without another funding source, um, really it continues as it has been so far. And we we do our best to pre-vet projects um, using the resources that we have. We determine if things are CDBG eligible. Um, if we do find CDBG eligible project that is projects, they're likely to be very complex, um, kind of like this multifamily property we've talked about. Um, the land bank's an amazing tool. We actually, um, have a couple of public housing properties that may be candidates for land bank acquisition in the future because we are questioning whether they'll have whether they'll be able to sell on the private market. And yeah. so we could continue at the current pace um, with very specialized and very challenging projects. But for any sort of standardized operations, funding would be a make or break. But if if we wanted to continue just as we have for the last year and a half, for 2024, we can continue. Mm -hmm. But it's trying to do the stuff that we all know we want to do and we should do is out of the question until we answer these three or four questions, correct? Correct. 
So that's that's why these three or four questions aren't going to be answered in a short period of time. That's why we say let's let's sort of take your foot off the accelerator and just pause for a little bit, idle for a little bit, work on the three or four things that we need to get done before we can say, okay, now we can put it back in gear and move forward. Uh, but based upon what we have now, we can continue doing what we're doing, Kay, mm -hmm. but I, I think everybody would agree it's been very frustrating the last year and a half trying to figure out how do we make things happen when we have these limitations on us? So we need to work through those points and see if we can figure out how to resolve those. And if so, then we can get back on track and get moving in the direction we need to go. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree with you. And in fact, I um, I support the recommendation. I just want to make sure that I'm clear that ultimately what it feels kind of like we're doing is saying either we're going to do this or we're not because the, the, the response we could get could defer the work indefinitely. I think so. I mean, I, I question why we have a land bank if we can't get tax foreclosure properties or we don't have funding other than CBG CBDG grants that limit us to the point where you can't even get a title policy to see if you could legally get title to a property. I mean, it, uh, they're giving us no tools to move forward. Agreed. Any other thoughts or questions? I mean, the, the proposal now is to suspend the February meeting and put together a few thoughts and plans as far as how we move forward and present those at the March meeting. Is that correct, Sarah? Yes, and in talking with um, Jeff, what we would probably bring is a proposal to suspend the bylaws. The bylaws require nine meetings a year. Um, we'll look through what those specific points are. That's easier than revising and then trying to revise back. Um, so we would suspend the bylaws and then basically move toward um, probably that meeting in March where we bring this back and hopefully have some disposition proposals for our current properties. Um, I would recommend conducting our April meeting um, because we could have reappointments or new appointments, and that'll be a chance to elect officers and basically conduct that as our annual meeting. And then at that point, suspend operations, um, maybe with a touch base meeting in the fall where we do an admin activity update and then the opportunity for the board chair, vice chair, or board as a whole to call special meetings when we have meaningful proposals. Um, we don't want to just bring, hey, we got a possible donation we're starting to look into. But if we've looked into it, vetted, and feel like it's ready, we'll reach out to the board and request that the board would call a meeting so that we can continue to pilot under the surface. We just don't want to... Um, spend the board's time saying, hey, we have a potential donation. What do you want us to do next? We want to really dig in and do it. And I, I think that's fine. I guess my only thought is I'd really like to have a little more discussion on what the it'll look like after uh, April. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to have that discussion in small groups between now and the March meeting and then make sure we're all on the same page. So maybe we could have some, uh, you know, non-board meetings, mm -hmm. some committee discussion, a few I of us. I would be to glad to conduct we could, what we would call like a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two yep. with board members. Um, that is different from a serial meeting because it's basically board members providing feedback. Um, the The content does not stream from board member to board member. But yes. it would be a chance for that conversation, individualized board feedback for staff to collect and bring forth a, policy, a proposal. We could do that without violating the open mm -hmm. meetings uh, rules and laws. So that's what I would propose. Does anybody have any discussion? I, I make a motion that we suspend the February meeting and that we prepare for March uh, with the information we just talked about as far as fair and have some conversation between now and then. So I make that motion.
Any seconds? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oppose the same sign. Okay. I think we have our marching orders. Anything else for discussion? So based upon that, we will not have a meeting in February. We will have a meeting in March. I believe that will be on the 13th of March at 1.30 at our normal meeting spot. And if there's no other business, I would uh, accept a motion to adjourn. Okay, Lucas, so, no motion. Second. No, second. Alex, all in favor say aye. All opposed, same aye. sign. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well.